Thank you very much, uh, Lori. I think, uh, uh, thank you. I'm honored. Uh, so honored to have you on the team and so honored to be here in Nunavut. Uh, as Lori mentioned, we're here to hear from people. We're here to listen to the concerns. We're also here to fight you. And one of the biggest concerns right now that has come up since just though I arrived yesterday, it's already come up a number of times, is of course the water crisis. We've heard from territorial government officials as well as the mayor that the cost to fix the problem is $180 million. And so today we are making our commitment is that we are demanding that the federal government provide full funding, the full $180 million at least to fix this water crisis. And the reason why I make this demand is if there's a water crisis of this nature in any other major city in Canada, Imagine if in Ottawa, the capital of the country, imagine if in Toronto, Montreal, Vancouver, in any major city, if there was a problem with the water, if there were hydrocarbons in the water, what would the federal government do? They would act immediately to fix the problem. And that's why we're demanding that the federal government step up and provide the, the sufficient funding needed to make sure we fix this problem so that the people of the Calumet, of Nunavut, can have access to clean drinking water. That has to be a starting point for justice, fairness, and, and decency is to make sure that that funding is available to fix this problem. I've also heard from a lot of people about the housing crisis. Lori's been really a strong advocate around this, raising the concern of housing. I've heard of this last time I visited, and as well now, just in a short period of time, I've heard many stories from, from young people that can't find housing, people who've got good jobs, 
we can't afford housing to people who have low income and no income can't find adequate housing. Uh, I met a teacher who is teaching in Uktitut, and, and it's so important that she's doing that work. She said, I'm teaching, uh, I'm a teacher, I'm, I'm trained and qualified, but I can't find housing. I have, I'm having to live with my aunt. And of course, you know, I live with my aunt, and that's that's okay, but I should be able to find housing here in Nicaragua, and she can't. That's a problem that we want to fix. So another major concern for us is the fact that there is there is a serious shortage of housing, and there is no access to clean, but to good quality and affordable uh, and, and good quality housing. That's a serious concern. So we're going to work on that. And as Louis mentioned, uh, in general, this is a this is a question of infrastructure. Having the infrastructure to respond to the needs of housing and to water. There has been a lack of funding for years. None of it has been ignored. The Calhoun has been ignored. And people are paying the price of this negligence of years and years of neglect. The federal government has not provided adequate funding for infrastructure, particularly with the climate crisis. We know that's directly going to impact people here in the north. And that means we need to invest in the infrastructure, that's water, housing, and other supports so that people can live a good quality life. And finally, I want to talk about just briefly other services. Um, we can't have more hope. We want to make sure there's housing and there's more people. We can't have that if there is not good access to water. So water and housing are directly connected. But we also know there's other services needed. And that's when we look at seniors, when we mentioned this, but we've heard from stories from people already that seniors, when they get ill, have to leave the community. They're flown uh, very far away and are end up being isolated in the South. Their family can't visit. They lose connection with their culture and their identity and their family. And it is not a way for a senior to age and dignity. So we want to make sure that seniors are cared for in the community, that they're able to stay in their home, stay in Nunavut, and receive home care. And so that's a really big concern. As Louis mentioned, repatriating elders back to Nunavut so they can remain in the community with their families and get the care they need. And finally, the young people today, I want to acknowledge, who are marching today at 12 or 12.30, they're raising concerns around mental health and, and suicide. This is an ongoing problem and is very serious. And I want to just acknowledge the courage of young people coming together and raising this concern and raising their voices. And I want you to know you've been heard. And I will be, with, along with Lori, working very hard on making sure mental health services are available here in the for, for young people and for people in general. Uh, thank you with that. I'm, I'm really, again, honored to be here. And I'm ready to take any questions you might have. En français. Uh, je suis tellement fier d'être ici avec uh, Laurie Hilda, notre uh, député dans ce comté. Aujourd'hui, on veut parler uh, de, de quelque chose, uh, trois choses en général. Premièrement, c'est la crise de l'eau potable ici uh, à Calumet. C'est vraiment une crise uh, et uh, ce qu'on demande, on exige le gouvernement fédéral de financer 180 millions de dollars pour régler ce problème. Si c'est le montant que le gouvernement territoire et le maire de Calvet ont dit, c'est nécessaire pour régler ce problème. Si on avait eu le même problème, ce problème dans aucune autre ville majeure au Canada, le gouvernement fédéral devra faire, euh, aurait, aurait euh, dû répondre immédiatement. Euh, mais dans ce cas, ce n'est pas la même chose. Et on dit que c'est injuste que dans un pays, dans une pays aussi riche que le nôtre, assez riche que le nôtre, qu'il y a une capitale, un territoire où on n'a pas accès au potable. Donc on doit régler ce problème et on doit financer tout le montant nécessaire pour régler ce problème. Deuxièmement, il y a une crise du logement. La crise par fort ici euh, dans notre territoire et c'est quelque chose qu'on doit régler aussi. J'ai parlé avec plusieurs personnes qui ont soulevé cette, cette euh, inquiétude. Ils ont euh, de la misère à trouver un logement abordable. Donc, c'est quelque chose qu'on doit régler. Finalement, euh, on, on a parlé des aînés, de nos, de, de nos aînés, et comment on doit euh, s'assurer que nos aînés, ici dans, les, dans la territoire, peuvent rester dans les territoires. Au lieu de ce qui se passe, ils, doivent, ils, ils, ont, ils ont besoin de voyager tellement loin de leur communauté pour avoir accès aux, aux soins. Donc ça, c'est quelque chose qu'on doit changer. Et finalement, les jeunes euh, se militent dans les rues euh, dans quelques heures pour euh, soulever le problème de santé mentale. 
et c'est vraiment quelque chose qui est aussi une crise et on doit s'assurer que les jeunes et aussi les gens en général ont accès aux soins de santé mentale. Ça, c'est quelque chose d'important aussi. Donc, merci uh, pour l'occasion de partager quelques mots. Je suis prêt pour vos questions. Thanks again for the time to share your thoughts with you. I'm ready for any questions you might have. We'll start in the room. Yes. And uh, there's one question with my follow-up. So, uh, yeah. Why 180 million for addressing the water crisis? Uh, what would that be used for and why would it be used? Uh, this is the amount that the territorial government and uh, Mayor Kimbella raised as the amount necessary to fix the infrastructure. Uh, and so we think that if this was a problem that occurred in any other city and, and Ottawa announced that to fix the water problem in the capital of Canada, if, if it was going to cost $180 million, the federal government would be there. We're saying that should happen here in Canada as well. But there shouldn't be any hesitation to provide the sufficient funding to fix a problem when people cannot drink the water right now. So it would be used towards fixing the infrastructure, making sure that it's no longer at risk of any contamination, and making sure it's resilient given that this is going to be a reality uh, as, as permafrost is no longer uh, at the same temperature as we're seeing cooling or seeing warming. Uh, we need to make sure that the infrastructure is built in such a way where it's resilient to this potential change. My follow up is that sounds great, but how will you get the Liberals to support this? So, we're going to first of all, we, we made this demand today. We're making it really clear that we need to see the federal government respond to the request of the territorial government here in Nunavut as well as the mayor. Uh, and we're going to keep on raising this issue. So this is the first step in applying pressure on the federal government. Uh, we're making the demand here in Akaliwa, and we'll go back to Ottawa to again apply pressure on the government to say, respond to this need, deliver the funding necessary. We'll go here next. We'll just ask folks to announce their name in the media that will ask for Thanks. Um, Emma Trent for the Canadian Press. Just yeah. to follow up on Jason's question, mm -hmm. have you had any conversations up? until this point with any of the ministers responsible for this file. This has been an issue for about a month, more than a month now. So what initiative have you taken prior to, to this announcement today? Yeah, so we raised the issue uh, directly with the government. We raised the issue that there needs to be immediate response. I raised it with the prime minister uh, when I had my conversations with him, and we've uh, communicated our concerns directly to ministers as well. Uh, in addition, now that we've learned the exact amount that the territorial governments and the mayor have requested, uh, that would be necessary to fix a problem. Now we're, we're supporting that demand and we're adding this to our, to our call for immediate action. I raised it before and now we're going to uh, enhance that demand by including the specific request as outlined by the territorial government. Uh, follow up this might be a question better suited for Lori, but the issues that you brought up, Mr. Singh, housing, mental health, um, those are issues that are long standing and we, we hear about them all the time. What will you do or what will the MP do to advocate for those issues differently around this time? Well, what we've seen, and, and Lori is going to be a strong voice uh, to continue to fight for this, is that Nunavut's been ignored. We've seen conservative and liberal governments continue to ignore Nunavut. And uh, it's just not good enough. It's, it's completely uh, unacceptable. It's wrong that an entire territory has been ignored and has been ignored. And we, we see right now across Canada, a, a really strong shift. And it's happened after the 215 kids were found in Kamloops. It's been this, this shift in Canada where people are saying the treatment of the first people of this land, the treatment of Indigenous people uh, has been going on for so long. People didn't realize it. People were confronted with the horrors of residential schools. And now we're saying, you know what? Uh, we, we, we mourn what happened. But what are we doing now to, to change this? What are we doing now to fix the problems? And that's a shift that's happened in Canada. And so here's an opportunity. If this government is serious about actually walking the path of reconciliation, as people are demanding, as people across this country are saying, something has to happen. Well, something can happen. And that's stop ignoring Indigenous people. Stop ignoring First Nations, Métis, and Indian. Stop ignoring Nunavut and the people of Nunavut. And so here we're laying out some of the things that can happen. Some of the things that can be done. And we're hoping that given this shift across Canada, where there's been a real palpable feeling that people want to see action, we're going to push this government to deliver that action. Uh, uh, Trevor Wright, uh, none of the news. Um, Akala is obviously one of the more higher profile water crises, but um, various other communities in Nunavut and First Nations as well have been facing this forever. Um, 
I guess uh, my question is, um, uh, is this a bring, do you feel that this helps bring more attention to the smaller communities out there? I think so. I think it's a really good point that if there's a problem with drinking water in the capital, what about in other communities? What about in some of the remote communities? Um, the fact that the capital of the territory doesn't have clean drinking water really draws and highlights, draws attention and highlights the problem that, that people are faced with. So uh, I think that we need to respond to this immediate crisis here in Canada, but we also need to make sure that every community in Nunavut and across Canada has clean drinking water. You're one of the world's wealthiest nations. There is no excuse that any community continues to not have access to clean drinking water. There is no way that that's in any way there's any excuse that can justify it. And, and I'm confident this is not a problem that's a, a question of resources or funding. This is a question of will. There is not political will. There's absolutely enough resources. There's absolutely enough technology. There's simply a, there's been a lack of will on the part of conservative and liberal governments to fix this problem, and it, that lack of will has meant that people have suffered. And so we're here to say that should end. That we need to see action, and we need to see a commitment that starts here in Italia and extends across Nunavut and across the country. Clean drinking water. Uh, uh, Lori is just swearing in from when it was last Friday. Uh, how does it feel to uh, keep the territory orange? To be honest, it's a pretty a huge honor. I'm really happy, particularly happy because Lori brings a lot to the table. So to have someone like Lori, who, as you know, is someone who's been a long-standing advocate for the people of Nunavut, uh, someone who's a lawyer who brings that legal knowledge as well to the table, uh, I'm really honored that we were we uh, announced that Lori is going to be our critic for really important files dealing with uh, Indigenous issues and justice for Indigenous people. And uh, it's a very important role that, she, that Lori's going to play on our team. And I'm absolutely confident that she's going to be able to fulfill that role with, with, incredible, uh, with incredible service. So I'm really excited about Lori. I'm really thankful and honored that the people of, of Nunavut again decided to elect new Democrats. And I want you to know you can count on me as leader, and you can absolutely count on Lori as your MP to fight for you, to raise your concerns. And that's why I'm here uh, to, to hear from people, to, to listen to your concerns, and to bring those concerns back to our world. Jane George, uh, CBC News. I have a question about elders, and I know that you've become aware of that since you got on the plane yesterday. And what what what's your game plan to help the elders that are in Ottawa and other communities in the South? What can you do? Uh, I'm going to bring Lori in on this as well, because I know it's something that Lori really, really uh, she cares about all these issues a lot. But this is something that Lori, you know, specifically briefed me on and talked to me about. Uh, the problem is, we just identified a problem for folks that don't know. In Nunavut, if someone is in need of care, they don't have access to care here in the territory. So what happens is they have to leave the territory and end up somewhere in the south. And they're far away from their family, from their communities, from traditional foods, from country food, from their way of life. To be so isolated only makes uh, the, the, the health care issue that they're dealing with Worse. And so what we're, what we're advocating for is there's got to be a better way to care for people in the communities. And that means it may be doubling down on, on home care, providing enhanced home care so that, so that seniors can live in their homes, in community, instead of having to go away from the community. Uh, one of the concerns that was raised is that a regional model doesn't work when people are so far away and so far apart, that if you've got a regional model in a place like Nunavut, it still means that families can't visit their loved ones, can't visit their elders. And so that's a serious concern. And I just want to bring Lori in on this for just an additional reflection on, on seniors and repatriating seniors back to Nunavut. Mm -hmm. Lori, if I could uh, speak a little bit louder as well, thank you. Uh, can you hear me? Uh, I think it's a lot of
naman kung kapatid siya niya, as yung iba kaya nang nakatka, kaman niya, in lang po, awdak si mga kaya, awdak si tao si mga kaya, kapatid, isurimat siya niya, at kaya niya kapatid, in yung surimat siya niya, so, kaya niya, ito kaya sarap niya niya, at kaya niya niya, at kaya niya niya, at kaya niya niya, at kaya niya niya, first of all, thank you for that important question, I've been very, I'm um, honored to be supported by my NDP colleagues. Uh, they've been very encouraging. Uh, I'll be working with the NDP caucus uh, to make sure that we're applying pressure. Uh, I'll be working with different critics to make sure that they are also uh, informed and educated about the realities of sending elders in the South, uh, explaining to them, for example, that not only are sending elders to the South uh, traumatic for the elders, but it's also breaking the important link between elders and youth. Um, we, we've seen that our sending elders to the South means that youth are suffering. Our youth are not learning from our elders. Uh, our youth are um, dying. There, there's always been considered an important link that needed to be established between elders and youth and the important services that elders provide to our youth by uh, educating them about our culture, about our heritage and the strength that we as youth have. So ensuring that our elders are uh, repatriated means that we're also allowing for many other things to happen, including ensuring that we're raising awareness about the important strength that youth have in our culture and the importance of ensuring that we have better services uh, for elders like home care, as Tiffany mentioned, as well as making sure that our elders have uh, proper adequate housing to live in. Uh, during my visits to the communities, it was so sad to see uh, the housing that's provided to our elders are elevated to so high, and these poor elders have to take all these steps to go to their homes, to leave their homes, and we have to make sure that we provide better housing for our elders. And so there's, it has to be a well-rounded approach and it really has to be focused on allowing and informing more Canadians about why these elders specifically need to be sent home because it's a matter of life. It's about, it's a matter of ensuring that we never know are getting the services uh, that they need for uh, improving conditions uh, for many, many more women. Thank you, Laurie. Today, the uh, also again on the Hello, can I have a little bit of a Jack Needlow, NDP, will you see? I'm a cover of the liberal quality of the league. Hello, can I have a little bit of a question? I'm a question about the community. I'm a little bit of a question. I'm a little bit of a question. I'm a little bit of a question. Thank you. 
transition house kung parang may uh, thematic na magkwa uh, sakit ang financial money account na yung importer after a while. Kami sa nito, o kami ito naman, nagkisayin ito ka digital to the two house na ito. Jane, did you get a follow-up question? Did you have a follow-up? Uh, no, I'm good. We're good? Okay. And I think we have all the questions here. Um, so then we'll go to Zoom. So now that's on that seat. Great. Thank you, Ali. Uh, just a reminder for the folks on Zoom, if you have a question, please use the function raise your hand. Un petit rappel pour les journalistes sur Zoom. Si vous avez une question, s'il vous plaît, utilisez la fonction lever la main. First question, we will go to Christy Kirkup from the Globe and Mail. Go ahead, Christine. Uh, Christy, you, do you want to go ahead? Maybe we'll come back to you if it doesn't work. Zoom life, you know, sometimes you yeah, just get I, to... <laughs> I was going to say two years into Zoom and we're still, we're still, uh, we're still figuring it out. So we'll go to Cormac McSweeney um, and then we'll come back to, to Christy afterwards. Cormac, go ahead. Can you hear me? We can. Thank yeah. you. Okay. Excellent. All right. Um, Mr. Singh, I'm just wondering if you could uh, please respond to what's happening in British Columbia right now uh, with the flooding that's taking place. Uh, the resources that are needed from the federal government and, and moving forward, uh, you know, what what infrastructure or needs could be supplied by the federal government uh, or worked on with the provincial government to try and address, you know, future disasters like this. I really appreciate the question. Yeah, what's going on in BC is really difficult right now. We've got uh, communities that are being flooded, highways are flooded, people are being evacuated. And there is no way right now, if you're in the interior of BC, to drive into Vancouver. The water is at such a level that all the roads are flooded. And, and someone, you know, I was talking about this issue recently, and someone said, well, how do you know that this, is, this isn't just a normal weather event? See, what we're seeing again and again in, in a community that people who know the lower, the lower mainland in, in BC, it rains a lot. But for there to be these type of, this type of flooding going on, for there to be uh, weather advisories about uh, extreme rain in a place that rains all the time, you know this is outside the norm. And the problem is that this isn't, this isn't a one-off. We're seeing extreme weather happen again and again. So the situation is pretty difficult there. We need to see um, federal government provide supports for evacuating communities with been mudslides. Uh, Abbotsford just announced a state of emergency in the local community in Abbotsford. So there's been there's been some serious uh, concerns and, and we're worried about what that means for people and their safety. So uh, we need the federal government to provide support, military support if needed, for communities that are evacuating, communities that are, uh, that are that are in need of immediate supports to prevent the, the flooding from getting worse. But your second part of your question is, is something that, that we are really keen on, on addressing. As we're seeing extreme weather increase, we're seeing more and more of these incidents where communities are being threatened by extreme weather. And so we need to build more resilient communities. And so a part of our response to the climate crisis has to be that we provide funds to invest in communities to make them more resilient. The extreme weather is becoming more common so that we need to make investments to make sure communities are safer. And that means mitigation when it comes to fire, when it comes to flooding, when it comes to extreme rain or extreme dryness. So those are things that we're looking at and we've appointed Richard Cannings, who's from uh, Penticton, uh, to, to be our critic for disaster, for the type of mitigation. And, and to uh, his community is one of those hard hit by the forest fires. His home was actually uh, within distance. He could see the forest fires as they were approaching. And he was living for a couple of weeks with his valuables in his car for an evacuation at any moment. That's a reality that people are up against. So we need uh, disaster mitigation funds to make sure communities are more resilient. We need immediate support for people in British Columbia who are facing this flooding, this flooding right now and this extreme water, water um, and water levels. And, and we need to be moving forward in a way where we're uh, making communities more resilient. Uh, 
Euh, donc, ce qui se passe en Colombie-Britannique à ce moment, c'est vraiment une, une crise. Euh, donc, on demande au moins fédéral de livrer l'aide nécessaire pour euh, aider les communautés en crise. Euh, on a des inondations euh, des, des euh, routes, des, euh, des autoroutes. À ce moment, ne pas, ne, ne, ne sont pas euh, fiables. On ne peut pas les utiliser à ce moment. Donc, on, on doit aider les communautés pour évacuer, évacuer les gens. Mais euh, la deuxième partie de la question, c'est qu'est-ce qu'on peut faire pour, euh, pour euh, prévenir ces choses dans, le, dans la vie? Et c'est quoi on a nommé Richard Canning comme notre porte-parole porte pour euh, des mesures pour euh, mitiguer ce sort de, de, de situation dans l'avenir? Parce qu'on sait avec la crise climatique, tout ça est vraiment causé par la crise climatique. Ça crée des, des situations de, de température extrême, des conditions extrêmes. Et c'est pourquoi on a, on a besoin d'investir maintenant pour euh, prévenir ce sort de crise dans l'avenir. Ça veut dire pour euh, avoir des, des communautés plus résilientes contre les feux de forêt ou les inondations. Donc, des investissements dans l'infrastructure pour euh, protéger les gens dans les, les cas comme ça, parce qu'avec la crise climatique, ce sont des, des, des situations extrêmes qui vont euh, répéter avec plus de, plus de régularité. Et aussi, euh, évidemment, on doit faire face à la crise climatique. Donc, euh, comme pays, on doit faire tout ce qu'on peut pour réduire nos émissions de gaz à effet de serre. And, uh, And uh, just... Yes, just as my follow up, um, uh, you know, we've seen reports today that uh, Canadian Blood Services is poised to recommend to Health Canada to end the restrictions on gay and bisexual men from donating blood. Uh, what's your reaction to this, um, this development after many have called for years and decades uh, for this uh, ban to end? Hey, this is a really incredible uh, moment, a really important moment, and I want to acknowledge all the activists, everybody who's raised concerns, everyone who's fought for this. This is a really important uh, victory. It should have been something that the, the government did on its own before. This is a homophobic practice that, that continues the uh, uh, myth, not based on any evidence or any science that, that, that perpetuates the idea that that people are dangerous or, or less secure or less safe to donate um, with completely unbased un facts. There's no basis in evidence for this. So to see this happen, it's a, it's a really important for something we've long called for, but I really want to acknowledge every, everyone who's fought to, to see this, this ban lifted. Uh, other countries have uh, had a process that, that evaluates risk based on, not on, on orientation, but on on someone's uh, risk factors that aren't based, that are based in evidence. And that's what we need to have. We need to have based on evidence risk factors, not uh, homophobic uh, risk factors, which, which I'm really happy to see that the Canada Blood Services finally say this is, this is something that's been lifted. Uh, and, and again, I want to acknowledge everyone who's, who's been a part of achieving this moment. Prochaine question, Mylène Cray de La Presse. Bonjour, est-ce que vous m'entendez bien? Oui, bonjour. Bon, bonjour, euh, j'aimerais savoir, euh, est-ce que la porte est réellement fermée et euh, verrouillée pour une entente avec les libéraux à la reprise des travaux parlementaires? Euh, non, euh, pas du tout, la porte n'est euh, pas fermée. Euh, on est toujours prêt de, de trouver des personnes à travailler ensemble, mais... Euh, Quelques éléments. Premièrement, les libéraux ne peuvent pas prendre, ne peuvent pas prendre pour acquis notre appui. S'ils veulent travailler ensemble pour aider les gens, on est toujours prêt à discuter comment on peut le faire. Il y a plusieurs choses euh, où on, on, on est d'accord et on peut aller de l'avant avec des, des projets de loi. Comme euh, quand j'ai des maladies payées, on a dit. Euh, à plusieurs reprises que c'est quelque chose d'essentiel et qu'on est, on est pour, on est pour une congé des maladies payées et si le gouvernement libéral veut 
présenter un tel projet de loi. On a fait de, de l'appui, quelque chose comme ça. Donc, euh, notre porte est ouverte pour travailler ensemble, pour aider les gens et euh, pour avoir une entente plus formelle. Il n'y a pas une, une option sur la table, mais euh, si le gouvernement veut présenter quelque chose, je suis ouvert à tout ce qui est. Si ça aide des gens, je suis ouvert à avoir des discussions. Et pour Quel votre suivi? Oui. oui. Quels moyens est-ce que vous entendez prendre pour... Euh... Vous êtes au Nunavut aujourd'hui pour nous parler des, des problèmes d'eau potable, euh, plusieurs enjeux euh, là où vous êtes présentement. Quels moyens est-ce que vous entendez prendre pour que les libéraux respectent euh, leurs promesses électorales en ce sens-là? Donc, euh, j'ai soulevé cette, euh, cette problématique avec le premier ministre directement dans notre, euh, dans notre appel. Et on a on a aussi avisé le ministre responsable de la nécessité d'agir tout de suite pour régler ce problème. On va continuer d'utiliser notre plateforme à Ottawa, au Parlement, pour mettre la pression sur le gouvernement pour agir. Et on, on va continuer de montrer l'exemple du fait que si c'était un problème à Ottawa ou Montréal, Vancouver, Toronto, dans une grande ville où ils n'ont pas accès, et ils n'ont pas accès au eau potable, le gouvernement libéral, le gouvernement fédéral aurait dû répondre rapidement pour uh, régler ce problème. Uh, et, et maintenant, on a le même problème à, dans la capitale, le territoire, et la réponse est lentement. Donc, on, on veut voir des actions rapides et le le gouvernement, euh, le gouvernement ici à Nunavut et euh, le maire a dit qu'au moins ils ont besoin de 180 millions de dollars pour régler ce problème. On exige le gouvernement de livrer le financement pour régler ce problème. Tout de suite. Next question, we will go back to Christy Kirka from the Global Mail. Hi, can you hear me now? Yes, loud and clear. Oh. Thank you, sorry, I uh, appreciate you bearing with me. Um, what I was uh, trying to ask was, what would the impact be should Ottawa not provide the $180 million that you mentioned off the top in terms of uh, the ask uh, to help to address the water crisis? What would be the, what would be the fallout of those? Yes. What would be the call? <laughs> The cost of not the cost the cost of not acting yeah uh, the cost of not acting would be a capital of the territory continues to have water that's been contaminated with hydrocarbons people cannot drink the water now there's a public health advisory saying very clearly do not drink the water uh, that's a serious problem and if it's happening in the capital of the territory there is there's huge impacts people from around Nunavut come to Calgary for services come to Calgary for For healthcare needs come to Calgary as a hub. So this isn't just impacting the people of Calgary, which is enough reason to respond, but it impacts all of them. This is a this is an impact on everyone here, and so it is really serious. So to not fix this, it, it would have devastating impacts. It's just not it's unimaginable, and that's why the government has to respond immediately. There there clearly was uh, problems with the infrastructure. That's an ongoing concern about from the north that, that the investments have been made to make sure that this community is, is able to, to be resilient, to, to live with dignity and respect, and that has to change. And so we're, we're demanding that this, at a starting point, help fix the, the immediate crisis. And then we want to see additional supports for housing and for additional communities that need access to drink drinking water. So it, it would be unimaginable for this not to be. And just as a follow-up, can you hear me? <laughs> yeah. Um, just as a follow-up, just turning toward the um, return of Parliament next week, I, I'm wondering since the last time um, that that we saw you and there were lots of questions about, you know, discussions with the federal government, and I know you've talked about, um, you know, openness to working in collaboration and, and partnership. 
Is there any update um, as we go into the beginning of Parliament uh, starting on Monday? There is no specific update. Uh, we remain really clear in terms of our priorities. We, we want to see supports for people. We want to see some of the decisions that are clawing back supports to vulnerable people, those, those decisions reversed. We want to see investments in fighting the climate crisis. And if there are any, any actions or any bills that will benefit people, that will help people out in this time, we are ready to work together to achieve that. Our goal is to help people. Uh, but the Liberals should be also really clear that we are not, we're not to be taken for granted. Our support won't be taken for granted. If they want to work together, we're ready. But if they're going to hurt people, then they should not be counting on us for support. They should look to the Liberals or to the, to the Conservatives or the, the Bloc. But uh, we are very open to making sure Parliament works for people. But that means making sure it actually works for people with real initiatives that make people's lives better. Thanks. That is it for questions on that, that is it for questions on Zoom. Thank you, Merci. Thanks so much, Melanie.